like to welcome everybody out to our Life Launch Center's parenting workshop tonight. We really are all about stronger families and stronger futures. We try to put these um, workshops on once a month and cover a relevant topic. And, you know, tonight, as we were kind of thinking about different topics, we felt like back to school was a relevant discussion. And it seems like, is it back to school or is it back to stress? You know, I mean, there's a lot of mixed feelings that come along when it comes down to back to school time. And sometimes it can feel like this or sometimes it can feel like this. And we're trying to help families have the tools that they need to, um, you know, make it so that it's a success, make it so that they can prepare and help their families grow in strength and in resilience. So um, we'll do a little bit of introduction. Uh, my name is Joe Newman. I'm the business development director here at Life Launch Centers. And um, I have a background in human development and family studies and studied that in college. So uh, that's enough about me, but I want to introduce Mike Flint. He's our uh, clinical director up in our West Jordan uh, center. And Mike, go ahead and take a minute and introduce yourself. So Mike Flint, uh, clinical director of uh, West Jordan. Um, and I love what I do. And I love working with Life Launch and the clients and the families and everything. And it's really a journey that uh, I've kind of been on for a long time. You know, when I was younger, I was lucky enough that I got to have plenty of excellent mentors and teachers and even, you know, some therapists and stuff that really kind of helped me to grow and develop and kind of set the stage for, for the first kind of intro into my passion of working with uh, youth and their families, which is uh, when I was 14, I started working at the Boy Scout camps uh, here in the Salt Lake Valley in Mill Creek Canyon, uh, which I loved. I got so much satisfaction of like, you know, taking, you know, these young minds outside and doing activities and trying to teach life lessons, but also, you know, having fun. And this, this led into other things that I did as I got older, you know, working as a direct support professional in some various, you know, like residential and after school things. Um, usually always with kids, adolescents, teenagers, and young adults. And so that's always sort of been an area that I've loved to work with. And even more than just my work life, uh, I've always had a big passion for uh, martial arts. Uh, and so I, I teach a kid's class of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, which is a, you know, a form of grappling, basically a martial art. And uh, I love seeing the various ways that young minds can grow and that can develop and figure out and about uh, after I graduated from the University of Utah with my bachelor's in psychology, I decided that I wanted to take it a step further and maybe take some steps towards being a therapist. And so I went to Arizona State University and got my master's degree in clinical mental health counseling. And that was about six years ago. And since that time, I've loved what I've been doing. Um, worked in a few different uh, like places and environments, but about five months ago, um, I decided that I wanted to try something a little fresh. And I reached out uh, to Life Launch and immediately, you know, is the people of Life Launch, kind of the environment of Life Launch and a lot of the curriculum of this resilience model and building resilience and, and kind of this outside of the box of, of the traditional talk therapy that we see, uh, you know, at Life Launch, we really try to go, you know, like I said, outside of the box and try some things, uh, you know, some experiential stuff and do things in, in the not traditional way, which was, which was normal for me because I spent all my time working with kids outdoors and trying different things. And uh, I really enjoyed it. Um, and uh, about, uh, like I said, that five months ago, I started it at Life Launch and I had this, in, this, this new wave of things that I had to do, deal with, new responsibilities, uh, new people, expectations, new skills, uh, new fears, new pressures, all these different things uh, that uh, I, I felt like, am I going to be able to handle this? Am I going to be able to pull it off? And yeah. I think that that's a, such a good segue into what we're talking about tonight is all of those things apply, you know, to starting a new job or doing any new experience. And yeah. every year, so many of our kids go through that of going to school. And Absolutely. so I see so many parallels you know between that of like what what is it like going to school and as joe said before like that's perfect for this this time because i'm sure that a lot of us uh you know as parents um are dealing with this same stressor and definitely a lot of clients are and students are is what absolutely. is about going back to school absolutely i mean these are skills that uh we learn as children hopefully and and uh carry them throughout our lives and 
And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about some actual methodology to this. And, um, you know, we're really about teaching resilience, like you said, and Mike's got an incredible background of resilience and all the different activities he's involved in and, and uh, does a great job in helping bring some of that experience and, and ideas to, uh, to our clients there in West Jordan. And, you know, this is really what it all boils down to right here is resilience and growth. You know, I look at these two guys, these, you know, this little guy and this bigger guy. And, and, you know, I think about this little guy as uh, you know, I have eight kids. I think about how I see my kids with, you know, I, maybe it's a bad habit, but I see them almost like they're adults, you know, like I see their potential and I forget that they're just this little guy still. And so I think that they should be able to handle stuff. I kind of like push them and, and, you know, expect that they should be able to handle stuff, but but it does, it takes time and it takes consistent effort and specific exercise. You know, if he's going to reach his adult potential, you know, like the bigger guy, he's going to have to do some exercises. And so the whole point of resilience is, you know, if you want to grow stronger, you don't avoid the exercises, right? And um, sometimes avoidance, because there's hard things in life, avoidance is the natural response that we want to like get away from difficult things. But what we have to do is help our children recognize that as they consciously approach these difficult things, these exercises, these resilience exercises, that they will become stronger and fulfill their ultimate, their adult potential. So, you know, that's kind of the first concept. And, and that's, let's take a look at what are some things that just stress students out? You know, why is back to school such a big deal? Well, Mike did some interesting um, kind of research or talked to some of our, our clients to figure out and hear from their mouths what, what stresses them out. So Mike, tell us a little yeah, bit about yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely. I was sitting here trying to think of like, you know, what are the topics? Because I, you know, sitting back, it's, it's hard as a parent um, to understand exactly what it is that your kids are going through when they're trying to get back to school, whether we're going into kindergarten, junior high, high school, college. It's, you know, it's hard to kind of put yourself in their shoes sometimes and say like, okay, you know, I, I totally understand what it's like to be a child in 2021, um, especially one that's going back school and that's a difficult thing to do and so I sat around thinking if only I had like access to a large number of people that had the stress about going back to school that would be great and then, oh yeah I kicked myself I was like wait a second I have I have all of these people that I can talk to and so kind of one of the main ways that I compiled this research and compiled this is the vast majority of these concerns and stuff we're going to go through come directly from the clients of life come from these interviews where I sat down, even if they weren't my, you know, you know, clients that I see on an individual basis and stuff like, what are you afraid of going back to school about? And I love that we were able to kind of take this, this uh, from so many different people and kind of make this, this list of like what stresses students out. And so most of these things that we're about to go through and talk about really do come straight from the mouths of students and uh, past, current, and most probably future um, you know, people that would come to life launch clients. Yeah. Students. Um, well, new so, schools, you know, new teachers, new classmates, it seems like new can either be really exciting or it can be really, you know, anxious on setting. So, um, you know, of course, schoolwork and grades are always a, a big part of the stressors, but we found some interesting things. I thought homesick was kind of an interesting thing. Maybe that's more of the college age or what it some of these uh, come from different age groups. Yeah, like the homesickness, like is a very different thing, you know, like the homesickness with the on like, you know, the collegiate level when someone's spending their first time spending multiple days not being at home uh, is is a separate but kind of familiar issue to let's say that we have someone going into preschool or kindergarten for the first time. It's that's really scary to kind of get out of the nest um and and spend time you know at this new place doing these new things and uh even just coming off of the summer i think is interesting where we have this kind of more safe secure thing where we're hanging out with the same friends doing the same stuff with our family but then as soon as the summer's over we're going into a new environment even if we have been at the same school um i think it's a normal thing just to feel a high level of anxiety going into a new environment because it's always going to be a little different than the time it was before 
Absolutely. And I mean, some of these things probably aren't very surprising to parents, you know, bullying, but I remember roommates for sure, new roommates, my freshman year, that was a, that was an eye opener, right? Huge stressor. Uh, then you got relationships on top of that and, and money management. Like, so, I mean, these really what I want to do tonight is make sure that we're getting to like the actual things that parents can do to help. And mm -hmm. so, you know, taking a look at, at some of those that are higher risk, you know, definitely those who are experiencing new situations, like a new school, um, new neighborhood, new area, right? Um, particularly those existing with uh, mental health concerns. Uh, that's kind of a no brainer, but an important one to keep in mind. Um, those who are struggling with identity, like that's pretty much every teenager, right? Like, all the different mm -hmm. aspects of identity. How did that play into your interviews, Mike? Yeah, so that's one that I find so interesting because trying to discover your identity is such an important part of growing up, right? Like, you know, in a lot of ways, I'm still trying to define like what is my identity right now, but it's to a sure. much less intense level than it was in junior high or high school. Um, being like, you know, that's important is like, that's why we, you know, go through, you know, through, through phases through those ages is we're trying to find who am I? Like, what do I believe in? What are my thoughts? Like, what, you know, what am I doing? And it's a natural part of like, you know, junior high and high school and really, you know, beyond to question things that, uh, that normally we didn't use to question before. And so I found a couple interesting things and, you know, the main one being that that's the time, especially for junior high and high school kind of area that it's, yeah. you're looking to try to decide who you are as a person, but then there's another like added level to it of, well, what happens if we have, you know, a different color of skin than the people that were around. What happened if we have a different kind of gender identity or a different sexuality or anything, a, a body that looks different than religion than our, or um, yeah, family religion. background, culture, it all plays into mm -hmm. that. Yeah, all plays into it of like finding that identity and how it's going to go, uh, you know, for you as you develop. So that's, that's a big one. So, you know, sometimes kids that are at higher risk come from overly strict homes, you know, when, when expectations are really, really high uh, and their pressure to perform is, is, can be debilitating. But on the flip side, it can be, you know, when they're unstructured homes, when they've, they're being used to being in summertime and they haven't had a lot of requirements during the summer. And now all of a sudden they've got all these classes with homework. And so, you know, knowing where you fall in your household, whether you're in kind of on which end of the balance can help help gauge what you want to do to prepare. And then, of course, those who have previously struggled academically. You know, I've got a, a, th a third grader who um, had a hard time reading last year and it was a big stressor. We had a whole lot of extra reading time with her. And, and now, you know, just going back to school, we're like, all right, time to rally around her because you know, it's, this is going to be, a, we're back to exercises, right? We're back to those stressors. And so, okay. so let's just jump right into, you know, what do we do? I mean, we've, we've already used just 15 minutes talking about the, the foundation here. And I, I really want to get into what we actually do. So Mike, tell us a little bit about what you mean here by just talk to them. Yeah, let's get down to the nitty gritty. You know what I mean? One of the things about any relationship, but particularly this, this relationship is having an open line of communication. What do I do to make sure that the, the back to school isn't stressful? Is like, let's talk. Let's, let's uh, be able to sit down with our kids. And it's more than just, you know, you know, sitting down at dinner time or when you pick them up from school or whatever the situation is of just saying, you know, oh, how was your day at school? I think that... Uh, really having like this open line of communication. I think that a lot of the time uh, we have like, you know, kids and, and, you know, teenagers, adolescents, like look at their parents and just like, oh, this person has no idea what I'm talking about. Yeah. Like, this person doesn't know anything. It's like, and I think that it's really easy for a lot of, of people in this age, age range to forget that in fact, all adults were teenagers at some point that they yeah. kind of went through this, you know, and it's easy to forget that because there's like these differences, you know, maybe of, you know, technology or, you know, different, uh, you know, you know, size, technology, and culture and lots of size, culture, so many different things, but, but, but being able to talk and have that communication that's a little bit deeper than just our traditional, Hey, um, 
how is school today? Did things feel yeah. good? Like having conversations, like we were talking about, like being able to empathize with them. Like there's like difficult things that I've gone through too. Praising when they when they do something well and and kind of uh, even like leading up to the school, the schooling I think is a big thing too of kind of normalizing that yeah, this is going to be a little bit of a struggle because that's I think one of the main things that we talked about tonight or that we've been talking about so far tonight is that uh, resilience is really one of those things that breeds the, the breeds power and confidence yeah, and everything. And so one of my favorite ones is, is leading with, don't lead with your anxiety. If you're a parent, if you start leading with your anxiety, your kids are going to pick up on that of, of I'm nervous for them. They're nervous for me. And instead turn it into something like, Hey, it was hard for me too. And it very well could be hard for you, but let's talk about the ways that we could potentially get through this because I know that you can pull this off rather than them feeling more or less like, oh, I'm different or I'm, I'm, uh, I'm unusual. I have one kid tell me, I feel like I'm a freak because I feel like I'm the only person going through this. And that could be solved really easily by just some basic conversations being like, yeah, you know what? Junior high and high school is hard. Let's talk about it. I love that empathy. And I know my kids like really thrive on when I tell them stories of what life was like when I was a kid. And mm -hmm. my dad, honestly, like when I was growing up, my dad was real busy and building his business and career and stuff. And so I didn't get a lot of that from him. And, but it's, so it's surprising to me how my kids like really do want to hear about what life was like for me as a kid. And it's, and it's not in a way of like, like it's, it's great when you throw out your own vulnerabilities, when you're like, man, when I was in seventh grade, you know, my schedule was way too much. I was overwhelmed. And you kind of let them see some of the weakness that you went through. And it gives mm -hmm. them confidence that like, okay, mom or dad got through this. I think I can too. So mm -hmm. definitely having that line of communication. Yeah. So, I love, I love too how it goes into our resilience model, which a lot of it is, has a lot of uh, that great Brene Brown research and, Brene Brown always talks about how vulnerability is power, even though it doesn't always feel like it, but being vulnerable is one of those things. And that doesn't just apply to kids. It applies to parents as well. Absolutely. So, you know, the next thing that um, is kind of a no brainer, but man, it's I, like, I forget it regularly is about balance in life. You know, they just came off a summer where balance was kind of like out the window in a lot of ways, particularly in sleep or food or physical activity, right? Like mm -hmm. particularly structure and, and time management and kind of thing. So, so teaching them balance, um, you know, is critical to help them maintain a, a healthy emotional state as they're going back to school. And mm -hmm. this is a little model that we use at Life Launch Centers to help both parents and, um, and students go through and, and identify like what ways that they could help their life be more in balance. Mike, tell maybe if you could share a little bit about how this model has helped some of the clients you've seen. Oh, I love this model. I think it's so fantastic. And, and the, the hand model in general, you know, we think about balance so much with the hand. And, you know, you kind of notice, like, how do we have the balance of any one thing? gets like a little bit too much or there's not enough balance and then we're going to lose equilibrium right and so some of these things that we look in there you know like are we eating right are we getting enough sleep like are we are we doing these things and i think that one of the things that i've seen a lot is is that people come in and they say i'm, I'm unbalanced because there's some of these things that i that i'm so worried about and so concerned about that don't necessarily there's too much weight to those things and you need to have balance in every single area in order to do that. And I think that, you know, doing this, you know, you come in and have someone do the program, this, that's, this gets uh, gone over more than once. Um, yeah. When we go over that, it's something that we reference all the time. And I think it's just such a great example of how, uh, you know, we can take some of these more difficult concepts and try to make them a little more, uh, a little more simple, a little more accessible. Um, so I think that it's amazing. Um, I know this is man. one place I go to real quickly when I see my kids struggling or stress is, is more than they're used to. And, you know, I go, well, let, tell me about your sleep, you know, like, you know, in our, in our model here, it recommends that we have eight to 10 hours of sleep. So if, you know, you've got to wake up at six o'clock 
um, what time do you need to go to bed in order to get that optimal, you know, amount of sleep and particularly with teenagers and they start thinking about planning their own time and sleep. I've got one daughter who's like, Oh, I function best with four hours of sleep. And I'm like, sorry, babe. Like, I know you think that's the case, but right here where you're all stressed out and kind of not so pleasant to be around is probably a good indicator that that's maybe not true. You know, and this is kind of, this is well-researched study that helps us know how we can maintain balance. And, and by the way, I'm going to um, include all of these pages and resources for the parents and anybody on our website uh, after, you know, by the end of the week, we'll have this up there. So you can refer back to it and maybe use some of these tools if you'd like to, to engage with those with your kids, but maintaining balance is huge. Let's, let's move on to our, uh, to our identifying a support group. And uh, we've got a couple of tools here, Mike, tell us a little bit about those. Yeah. So these again are things that these are right out of our life launch curriculum and right of our, right out of our handbook. And, um, the tools, you know, are, are fantastic. One of the main areas that we focus on of our fundamental areas when the, in our resilience model that we use is one of them is all about building connection, right? And that goes into the communication piece. Um, it goes into the relationship piece. Um, but being able to, to build those connections and, and have support is super important for anybody, right? Like you need, like as human beings, we need support from other people. There might be some people that are a little more, you know, uh, maybe you said, you know, on the loner side, a little more independent than others. But at the end of the day, we all need this kind of support and interaction. And one thing that I saw that I really, really thought was, was interesting or that I heard of from interviewing the clients at Life Launch was hearing that like, basically everybody said, yes, I do need someone. And maybe the person that I need for this particular struggle or this thing that I'm going through maybe isn't my parent. But right. that doesn't mean that they can't, they can't, there, there can't be a void there. there. There has to be something there. And the good news is, is that with schools, um, there's a lot of ways that we can do that, right? We have uh, school counselors, we have trusted teachers, we have the other school staff that can, that, uh, you know, can be trusted. And we have the mental health staff, if that's something that we need to pursue. So many different people in different areas that can be supportive. And that goes into also uh, extracurricular activities, right? Yeah. Like if, if you have a kid that's so afraid to go into school and not only do this because I don't have any friends or I'm afraid of being bullied, like let's try to work to get some friends. Like, what are you interested in? There's, there's chess clubs, there's, yeah. you know, there's sports. There's so many different avenues. And at least for me, when I was going through school, that was like a big thing was that social support and, and having friends. Um, and then even in college, it was really important for me too to be able to have a strong, solid support group around me. Um, and uh, being in different areas, yeah. Absolutely. And, and the fun thing about this courage worksheet here, this is an acronym that kind of helps, uh, you know, helps us identify what people are going to be, you know, safe and supportive, right? So they're going to have good communication. They're going to have open-mindedness. They're going to be understanding. And as, you know, a child or anybody thinks about people in their life, who, who represents these characteristics in their life, then it makes it a really easy for them to, to actually choose people who are going to be helpful in their support group. Because oftentimes mm -hmm. we choose people who are not helpful in our support group, right? Or those that may be dragging us down and we go to them with our problems and then it just compounds. So it's a really yeah. helpful exercise and important that everybody is able to identify for themselves, you know, like who is my support group? Who do I turn to when I'm feeling weak or need some extra strength? So, yeah, a great example that I love about that, that we talk about in curriculum is who would you want to go with a road trip on and who should you go on a road trip on now you might have a really fun friend and they're like oh let's go on a road trip but they're unsafe or you have a friend they're like i could never spend my time in a, in a car with this person going down so it's like really about you know if life is a road trip like who are we picking to be sitting in the seat next to us and sitting in the back seat and so such an important part of love kind of going back just to step like discovering our identity who are we a lot of our identities the people we surround ourselves with love that absolutely so here's the fourth thing, uh, teach them healthy coping skills. So let's talk about distress tolerance tools and some of the things that we teach here at Life Launch Centers. These are actual physical things you can do and you can teach your children to do 
when they experience big stressors, like maybe taking a test. I know personally, when I was taking a test recently, uh, and it was a timed test, which I hate timed tests. Like mm. I, I just totally get hijacked and can't think. And so I practiced paced breathing, but, um, you know, mindfulness, all of these are, are helpful things. And maybe let's take a minute and explain maybe each of these distress tolerance tools. I mean, there's like more than 40 or so that we teach here, but, but maybe there's a few tools that the, the parents can explore and get a, a, you know, ground level understanding of what these different tools are. Absolutely. And when I think about tools, a lot of the time I think about a toolbox. There's different tools for different scenarios, right? If I hand you a screw and I was like, okay, we got to put this in this piece of wood. And then I give you a hammer and I'm like, all right, good luck. Let's get this. Let's get, get down to it. Like that's not going right. to work. That's not going to work. Yeah. There's the right tools for the right situations. And I think this uh, plays particularly well into school. So for instance, let's say we're sitting in a classroom and it's, we're, we're coming up on a presentation that we have to do. Uh, some people really like doing a nice, like little like power yoga stretch, like, you know, doing some stretching or like mm -hmm. you know, doing something like uh, a lot of people give themselves like out loud, positive affirmations. Mm -hmm. If you, Stand up right before it's time for your presentation. You start stretching and being like, "You're powerful, Mike. You can do this." This, this it might it might come off as a little strange. So, <laughs> might not is, be the right timing for that one. Yeah, the good news is, is there's tools for every situation, and so kind of some of the general ones we're talking about with our distress tolerance tools, like mindfulness, is one that we're doing all the time here. Um, mindfulness is basically like, I'm, can I, can I be in the moment, right? If I'm, if I'm doing something where I can be in the moment and focusing on a particular job and uh, giving, giving our mind a task of something that we can do, then it's really hard to worry about something. Um, it's really hard to worry about something uh, like about like stress or anxiety if we're totally yeah. involved and focused on something else. Uh, so there's many mindfulness tools. Paced breathing is a great example of this where you can sit there and you'd be like, okay, I'm getting ready. Say we have, you know, something to do like, like a presentation in front of a bunch of people. <laughs> we can sit there and go, okay, let's do some nice square breathing. So four breathing breaths in or four uh, seconds breathing in, four seconds breathing out. And we do that until our breath gets back under control. And then we try to go outside the box. When we were talking about going outside the box, ice diving is another one that I really like. Let's say you're having some anxiety at home. One of the things that we teach is a great uh, exercise that we love over here is get a bag full of ice or fill up a bowl of ice water and just dunk your face in it and hold your face in it for about, for about four to five seconds, take out two, three or four deep breaths and go back in. And it really does change the physiology of what's going on in your body and activate something that's like basically an anti-stress response called uh, the, the vagus or the vagal nerve response. So that is an, an amazing one too. Um, and I know that and sounds like, kind of crazy, but I can testify that that one works. Like there's that, that vagal nerve, it's right underneath your nose right here. And when you feel something cool on it, it activates the mammalian dive reflex, which slows your heart rate okay so this is like something crazy you can do especially if you have a kid that's like prone to anxiety attacks and they you know just need some you can use a water bottle you can like if sometimes your hands are cold you can use your finger to kind of initiate that but um that's a a, a really effective tool not to be used if they have any heart conditions i gotta get sure. throw that yeah. caveat out there but but it's, um, it's kind of one that kicks them out of a uh, anxiety attack, you know? So. Yeah. And I love the bizarreness of it too. A lot of times it's like, how about you just take a few deep breaths, which is an excellent tool. But I mean, kind of coming out of the box and being like, rather than calm down, take a few deep breaths. It's like, how about you go and you dunk your face in some ice water? I mean, <laughs> even just yeah. that on its own kind of takes you out of that weird you know, stress state. And then yeah. we have self-compassion and touch so many. And like Joe was saying here at Life Launch, we teach over 40 different distress tolerance skills. Um, and all of them are excellent. And a lot of them are good for different situations. So it's so like one said, thing, just like it's one I like to show with uh, self-compassionate touch is just the hand on the face. Like this one makes a lot of sense to me. And you see people do this all the time. And, you know, you can even like guess what somebody's feeling when they're like, ah, you know, we do this instinctively, but really what we're doing is like, we're reassuring through the palms of our hands and the breath that hits that like, 
are, you know, that we're okay. We're still breathing. We're not, you know, going to die. And it's, it really does. It quiets that mid near that uh, hind brain that's worried about the, the, you know, automatic life support functions and our, our hind, our mid brain kicks in. It's like, okay, let's quiet down the amygdala. It's okay. We're, we're not dying here. You know, those are all really effective, um, you know, tasks or like physical things we can do to literally slow down our heart rate. Absolutely. So there's, there's a lot of skills there and we can talk a lot about those. There's, there's other resources on our website too, if you want to get kind of some more in-depth discussion about those, but um, let's talk about this. You, you kind of alluded to this a little earlier about trying something new. This in and of itself can be a solution to helping our kids deal with the stress, which at first it kind of made me like wonder is like, if they're going back to school, is this really the best time for them to learn chess? Like, you know what I mean? Or mm -hmm. how, what do you mean by, you know, trying something new? How does this help relieve stress? Yeah. So it, it kind of brings me back to one thing where I was talking before about how much I love martial arts. And one of my favorite quotes came from this uh, guy who wrote this, this book called the book of five rings. And it's all about like basically being a complete person, but it's written by a sword fighter. And he says every sword fighter should be a gardener and stuff. And I think that uh, when we talk about this resilience, like if we go back and we think about the little guy that turns into the big muscular guy, like it comes from, building resilience and trying things new. And Musashi says about this, which is one of my favorite quotes of all time, is that he says, if you find, um, how do you say it? So if you learn the way deeply in one thing, you will start to see the way in all things, which basically interprets that. To me that, that if you learn how to do something difficult and something new and something novel, that's hard to figure out, whether you know it's chess or other other kind of club or yoga or anything like you, you learn how to do something new and novel that you see as potentially difficult you can learn how to do anything that's difficult because you learn the steps and the process of is like this is how i learn to master things and this is how i learn to control things and that only comes from learning something new if we only did stuff that we already knew how to do, then we would never grow and we would never develop and we would never develop resilience, which I feel like is one of the great threads that we're talking about tonight that goes through everything is how do we develop resilience is we learn how to do new things. And even sometimes it's a big, scary word that no one likes to think about, but sometimes we fail at stuff. Yeah. But we can learn lessons from those failures um, and it will make us like a better, stronger person. Then the next time we fail, even if it's something that's a completely different discipline, we can look at it and be like, well, I know what to do with failure. I learned from it. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think about a variety of different activities, you know, whether it's singing or dance or, or chess or, you know, repelling, um, you know, all these different activities that, that, you know, I, I was learning in my positive psychology class a little bit about having flow experiences. And when there's a new activity that you have to apply your mind to and, and learn and become better at, the rewards are really high, especially at the beginning as you are learning and progressing. And it, it gives you a whole sense of confidence, which, like you said, can translate into other stressors that are presented at school. And so you think back and you're like, man, I repelled down that huge cliff. Like, surely I can get out there and, you know, play softball with the PE class or whatever, you know, or. Absolutely. Or yeah. So that's awesome. Try new things. That's a, that's a really great, a great uh, suggestion and help, help your kids come upon some new things. <coughs> They're going to have a hard time coming up with ideas. So that's kind of our role, I think, as a parent to, to open their mind to the possibilities. So. Absolutely. So kind of the last one here, we talked about connecting with the outdoors. And um, this is a really interesting one because, uh, you know, we spent summertime, usually we're on vacation, we do some things, you know, out, outdoors often. But then now we go back to a, a routine where we're indoors for, you know, a third of the day. And, and that can, in and of itself, onset some stress because nature naturally recharges us. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, I love, I, I kind of hand selected some of these pictures because 
Sometimes when it comes to nature, people think, oh, I got to hike to the top of a mountain in order to have a real you know, nature experience. And, and for some people that that effort was definitely what's going to get them there. But some of us don't have access to that. Some of us, you know, sometimes it's just sitting out in the park and observing the leaves on the tree fluttering in the wind. And really, that's kind of like a mindfulness exercise where you become grounded with your, your in natural environment, right? Or just... Yeah looking up at the clouds and, and, you know, I got to say, like, I don't know a lot of kids that look up at the clouds anymore because I see more kids looking down these days, right? Like the hard part about our culture and our society today is technology has just really eliminated a lot of those natural five minute, 10 minute intervals where we would connect with nature. And so as we share those ideas with our kids and help them learn about how if they'll just take a minute and soak in the sun rather than soak in the blue light of their, their phone as it reflects up as they're looking down, like that's naturally going to help them feel better. I, I love this picture of this little girl because it's like of every age, doesn't matter how old you are, you know, whether you're, you know, three or four years old here, pounding, you know, stomping puddles in the rain. She's all elated because she's connecting with her natural environment. And so as, as our kids schedule changes and they're more involved in, in, uh, you know, studies and things that happen indoors, we have to, as parents really be mindful to naturally introduce and continue to carry on those healthy outdoor activities. Um, what, what other experiential things have you found Mike that really help in, in connecting with outdoors? Well, man, I, I think, Joe, you, you did so well, you know, explaining that of like that importance and even, you know, talking about my past background of like, that's where I really started to see a lot of these changes in, in kids and like see them have like kind of this new experience all the way back to when I was 14, taking around kids out in the mountain air in the canyon taught me the importance of that. And I think that, uh, you know, being outdoors, like you're saying, is a mindfulness exercise. And there's some real, real value in being able to do that. And it becomes hard. Like it becomes one of those things sometimes where we have to like carve out that time to be outside because I, you know, when we were talking about this. It's like, what is, what is less welcoming and, and, and more different than being in a forest than being in a junior high hallway. Yeah, right. High right. It's totally. So flat. And boring. And you spend, you know, hours of your day, you know, six, seven hours, like sitting inside this like classroom contained um, and, you know, inside this building. And it becomes really easy to kind of neglect those like basic things that really make us human, like our connections to being, you know, to the outdoors. Um, and the thing that's interesting about it is that I see, you know, my own son is, is he's only 18 months, right? But when I take him outside, it's a very different experience with him yeah. inside than outside. He's looking around, his breathing slows down. And I can see that oh, it makes yeah. a tangible effect, not only on his mental state, but on his physical state. And just because we get older, it doesn't mean that we lose that. Like Absolutely. that's something that remains is a fundamental part about being a human being. And I think it's one of the main things that can really, really easily fall to the wayside if we're not paying attention to it and doing it. And uh, like you were all saying, Joe, is sometimes as parents, what we got to do is we have to take those steps of being like, guess what? We're doing something outside. Like we're yeah. going for it because maybe they won't do it for themselves because as great as clouds going across the sky is sometimes TikTok's a little bit more interesting than that. And we've yeah. got to, we got to make a power move and make sure that they get out and get that outside time. Man, I tell you, TikTok is very enticing and, and it's a hard thing that you have to, um, you know, introduce things that are even more enticing into their lives. And so some of these activities, you know, uh, and, and, I often say to parents and people like it is easier to put a screen in front of your kids, right? They're, you know, they need to relax. You're going to let them recharge. And our go-to seems like now it's becoming that we go to this or they go to their you know, video games or YouTube. And, and unfortunately we do, we do know that when people interact through screens, we don't produce oxytocin. We produce dopamine, which is a short-term happy hormone that's highly addictive. And so we are looking for connection through the screen, but it can never produce 
what we actually feel when we're eye to eye, face to face with humans or connecting with nature. And so we do have to kind of make those, those tough choices and, um, and, and put it together. And, and really what we're talking about here is that we're not, you know, when, we, when, when it comes down to this whole resilience thing, right? I go back to this picture that we're not trying to avoid the exercises, right? Like stress, you know, back to school, back to stress. Yeah, that's it. You're going back to school and it's going to be stressful. But when we have some of these tools in place, some of these things that we know that we can get some relief and some rest from it, it's a lot like these two guys, you know, if you had a, a trainer, you know, a physical trainer that was like, okay, we're going to lift weights and you're never going to get a break. You're just going to keep doing reps over and over and over man, that gets really overwhelming fast, right? But if you know that there's short breaks in between that can help you recharge, that's what builds the resilience. And so that's the same thing with, with back to school, back to stress. Yeah, it's going to be tough, but these are the exercises that help give you the tools to successfully navigate life as an adult. Kind of like what you were saying at the beginning, Mike, when you're starting a new job and, you know, how do those, how do these tools you know, relate to your life now as an adult. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think that you're, you know, you're so on point with that. And that even if we don't exactly understand what it is our kids are going through, we all have those fears. We all have those concerns of whether we're starting a new job, whether we're getting into a new relationship, whether we, you know, we've gotten a promotion, we, we joined a new social group, uh, these things that give us this stress because they're new and they're novel and they're, there's this potential fear of like, well, what if this doesn't go well? What if this doesn't go right? And I think that really what we're talking so much about tonight is how do we recognize that those things are difficult, but also embrace them for future growth? Because that is, again, how we grow. Growth doesn't come without a little bit of struggle. And uh, those that shy away from struggle don't grow. Those that embrace struggle, that's where the growth comes. And I think that applies to more than just school. Um, and so I hope that's something that everyone can kind of take away from tonight is uh, how do I embrace the hard things, whether it's school or any of these, these other things. And also how do we support our kids that really are going through something really hard. It is hard to go back to school. Absolutely. Good. That was beautiful. And thank you, Mike, for sharing these tools. Thank you for taking the time to share some of your experience as a counselor with Life Launch um, Centers. And, and um, yeah, you know, for us, it really does boil down to stronger families and stronger futures. And, uh, you know, I, if you have some questions, you want to get some further insight on these tools that we've talked about, feel free to jump on our website. We're going to have this on the website by the end of the week, as well as those pages that we, that we showed in the slides. And, um, you know, feel free to, to uh, reach out to us as well. Give us a call if you have any questions or concerns with, with loved ones who may be struggling with anxiety or depression or need some additional support in learning some of these tools. So thanks again for joining us, Mike, and everybody for jumping on this call. It's been great being with you and uh, appreciate everybody's input. That was great. Thank you, Joe. And thank you for the whole Life Lunch family. You guys are great. All right. Have a good night.